Harriet Tubman began her life in the bonds of slavery, but lived her life helping others achieve their freedom. She really helped black people have a sense of um, self, a sense of freedom, and a sense that, you know, slavery was not right. Araminta Harriet Ross was born into slavery around 1820 in Dorchester County, Maryland. As a child, she was loaned out to different plantations. By the time she turned 12, she was working in the fields. When she was a young teen, she suffered a severe injury which would affect her for the rest of her life. A slave owner threw a metal weight at another slave and accidentally hit her in the head. For the rest of her life, she suffered epilepsy, terrible headaches, but she also had these strange visions which she ascribed to God communicating to her. And she took these visions as a symbol of her mission, like Moses, to go and free her people. In 1844, she married John Tubman, who was a free black man, a fairly common occurrence in Maryland. Harriet was determined to escape her life of slavery, and in 1849, she finally did it. She risked her life by making her way from Maryland to Philadelphia. She followed the North Star and used the so-called Underground Railroad to make it to freedom. The Underground Railroad was an organized group of free blacks, whites, and Christian abolitionists who helped slaves escape to the North. Harriet had made it to the Promised Land. No one would have blamed her if she never returned to the South, but she desperately wanted to free her family. She made perilous trips back to free her two brothers, her sister, and her sister's two children. When she made a third trip to get her husband, she found he had taken another wife. Instead of returning with her husband, she saved more slaves. Not only did she escape slavery and achieve freedom for herself, but she went back down into the South to bring freedom to dozens of other slaves. Harriet was clever as she was brave, figuring out countless tricks to bring many slaves to freedom over the next several years. The fact that she developed these paths and trails that took people through the country and they traveled at night and they used quilts to, to have secret codes and, and know the paths and then to bring people north across the Mason-Dixon line into Ohio um, to find freedom. So she was a pioneer and I think a very, very strong woman. Her legendary status as an underground railroad conductor earned her the nickname Moses. Well, I think Harriet Tubman's uh, name Moses, you know, comes from Moses from the Bible, leading people to freedom. And it's a very, very proper name, I think, for her and, and one that she definitely lived up to. In 1850, things became more dangerous for Harriet when the Fugitive Slave Act was passed. Instead of being a free woman, she was now a fugitive. She continued to free slaves, but now guiding them to Canada so they could truly be free. From 1851 to 1857, Harriet lived mostly north of the border in St. Catharines, Canada. She continued to make trips to Maryland twice a year to save more slaves. Besides her work as a liberator of slaves, Harriet spoke in support of anti-slavery and women's rights. Her efforts made her a wanted woman with a bounty on her head, but she was never turned in. She aided abolitionist John Brown with his plans for the raid on Harper's Ferry. During the Civil War, the government asked her to help the Union cause by organizing a network of spies among black men in the South. Not only was she known as the Great Liberator, but she also assisted the Union Army, going down on patrols and advising Union officers on how best to attack the South. Out in the trenches, she also helped Colonel James Montgomery disrupt Southern supply lines, which resulted in the freedom of hundreds of slaves. 
After the war, Harriet dedicated herself to establishing schools for freed men in South Carolina. Even though she couldn't read or write, she understood the value of education. In her later years, Tubman worked with her friend, Susan B. Anthony, to support the cause of women's suffrage. Harriet Tubman is relevant today, not only for her work in terms of racial justice, but also in terms of women's rights. After the Civil War, she became an outspoken supporter for the suffrage movement to get women the right to vote. To help make ends meet and continue to help the causes she believed in, she worked on a book called Scenes in the Life of Harriet Tubman. In 1908, she established a home for older poor African Americans in Auburn, New York, which she moved into in 1911. She lived there till her death in 1913 from pneumonia. She was buried with full military honors. I was young, but I remember Harriet Tubman, um, you know, has a lot of significance for black people, particularly in the age of Obama, because she kind of started the liberation of black people, um, you know, in the days of slavery, and, and really set the path of civil rights uh, in the United States. Harriet Tubman's bravery and determination allowed her to accomplish incredible things throughout her amazing life. From Galilee. She is someone that you cannot forget. She is someone that, that really kind of changed our perception of what equality and freedom and liberation and civil rights mean. The hour I first I first Allison Saar. I'm the artist that uh, was commissioned to create the Harriet Tubman Memorial here in Harlem at St. Nicholas and 122nd. The piece is titled Swing Low, which was thought to have been one of her favorite spirituals, but it was also thought to be um, a codified song to signify when and where someone would be able to hop on the Underground Railroad. She's a cast bronze figure uh, resting on granite. Around the base, there are quilt-like squares that simultaneously refer to the tradition of freedom quilts, which were thought to have been used as signals for the Underground Railroad, interspersed with images that kind of mark certain stations of Harry Tubman's life. I love the way that the artists use um, symbols to tell a story, and that's such a part of African-American cultural history. It's nice that there's a text panel that tells you her history, but I also wanted to have that history put in pictorially. Um, one, to kind of honor her being uh, unable to read, but also that people come here, I mean, this is an international community, and that people, no matter what language you speak, you can really understand her story by looking at these pictures. Little children can look at those little pictograms and think about their own lives and think about the stories that they're, they're part of history. They have a responsibility to create their own history. It's important for us to remember all of our heroes, but it's especially important to me for us to remember the female heroes. Somebody like Harriet Tubman had many different vocations in life. She was a nurse. She worked for the, she was political. She supported the, um, the army. She worked as a spy. She was a healer. She was a soldier in the Civil War. She was so courageous. They called her a conductor on the Underground Railroad because she made several trips. As this piece really shows, she is not just a conductor, but she actually embodies whole idea of the train or of movement and transporting people. If you look at her, she uh, is like this unstoppable railroad herself. She's kind of plowing down the middle of the street. Her petticoat has become like this cattle catcher sort of parting traffic. 
trailing behind her all these roots, which kind of, for me, symbolized the uprooting of slaves. You know, they basically, I mean, Harriet herself didn't tell her husband she was leaving. She just, you know, you had to steal away in the middle of the night and you couldn't tell people because you never knew who they were going to tell. But also, just her role in terms of uprooting the institution of slavery as well. So it kind of takes two sides of the idea of uprooting. Within her skirt, I wanted to incorporate these sort of spirits of all the people she helped bring to, to the North and to freedom. And so it's a very tactile piece. And I'm hoping that at some point, you know, that it'll start taking on the patina of all those that come and touch her and sort of, you know, relate to her in that very sort of tactile, physical way. Plans to put a woman on the $10 bill ran into high drama and a Broadway musical. Today it came to a surprise ending. Alexander Hamilton stays on the sawbuck. Abolitionist Harriet Tubman replaces Andrew Jackson on the face of the 20. And that's not all. Here's Juliana Goldman with $35 and change. The abolitionist who risked her life bringing hundreds of slaves to freedom is moving a slaveholder and former president to the back of the bill. Having a woman on the 20 was really important, and I think Harriet Tubman will tell a powerful story about what an individual can do in this country to change the course of history. This wasn't the original idea. Treasury Secretary Jack Lew initially planned for a woman to join Alexander Hamilton on the 10, but a Broadway hit about the founding father and first Treasury Secretary meant newfound fans rallying around not a woman, but Hamilton himself. You're not denying that Hamilton the musical played some part in all of this decision. I wouldn't exaggerate it. When I saw the show in August, uh, I already at that point told the, the, the people I talked to, don't think this is going in a place like you read about because it's more complicated than that. It's bigger than that. So Lou went bigger, minting women's place in history on the 20, the 10, and the 5. The back of the new 10 will honor suffragettes like Susan B. Anthony, and the redesigned 5 will feature Eleanor Roosevelt and showcase historic events at the Lincoln Memorial, like Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. The designs for all three bills will be unveiled in 2020, the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote. They'll go into circulation in the years following. Barbara Howard has been pushing to get a woman on the 20. The 10 will be distributed uh, in early 2021, and we'd like to hear that same commitment for the new 20. The issue with timing is security and making sure the money can't be counterfeited. Scott, ultimately, it's up to the Federal Reserve to decide when money goes into circulation. And so Lou tells us he's asking the Fed to expedite that process. Juliana Goldman next door to the White House at the Treasury. Juliana, thanks very much.